All right, now, everybody. Quiet, listen to me. We're going to start a show. Now, some of you people have been with me before. You know it's going to be a tough grind. But we're going to have a show. And hello, all, across the webverse and across the universe. Great to have everybody in the mix today. Oh, my God, there's some crap going on in America. There's also some big stuff going on in other parts of the world, which we'll get to. And it's not bad news, either. Yeah, I'll get to that uh, in a moment. I know it's a little off-brand for us to do something that's not bad news, but I, you know, I really hope to get to it. Kim is here. Kim, how are you? And uh, Tony is here. Thanks, Tony. Tony, who uh, helped with the relighting of the studio over the weekend, and uh, it, it's a subtle change, maybe. But actually, there it's the beginning of uh, some bigger changes. We're going to backlight this or something, Tony. Isn't that what's going to happen? Yeah, you did turn on the red light. I saw the, the, the little woman. Oh, so I far. need to turn on the red light. <laughs> Roxanne, turn Dude, on the red is. light. <laughs> what? Yeah. Roxanne, turn on the red light, baby. Thanks, yeah, Tony. I know what you're saying. <laughs> but there's something special before we get to all the news. And, of course, the Supreme Court, not surprising. But I've got some pretty decent analysis ahead for you. We will uh, also have just a quick look ahead, and then I will, as I say, um, we have a special guest to get us kind of set up for Mark's Madness, which is coming up. Not March Madness, if you're new to the show. This is a radio show that we move to YouTube, and one of the features every March to coincide with March Madness is Mark's Madness. Now, Mark's Madness, we put up drops against each other on the show. The audience votes on them. We have brackets just like March Madness. But uh, a major announcement? Uh, I don't know if it's a major announcement. But uh, you can tell me. But uh, before I get to that, I want to mention that we have True Crime Corner coming mm -hmm. after Kim's News, bottom of the hour with a special guest, a true crime investigator and author of The Berman Murders. The author will join us, so that is really big. And, of course, Courtney will be here. And uh, a word about animals with Karen at the, what, the second half of the second hour. So there's a, a lot. To, is that clear? I felt as though it was a bit. Um, you just don't get it, do you? I felt. You don't. I don't. I don't. I don't think I lay things out clearly enough sometimes. Uh, but anyway, that's the, that's where we are for the moment. The Mark Thompson Show. I'll get all into the SCOTUS ruling. I'll get into an important aspect of the SCOTUS ruling that is not being talked about, even with the unanimous decision. I'll get to that in a moment. But um, first, I'd like to... Um, the Mark Thompson Show. I'd like to welcome him because he is the commissioner of sports on this show, normally not on on a Monday. But here he is with a special look preview of Mark's Madness. He is Kamish Albert, everybody. Yes, Albert. Welcome, sir. Wow, working overtime. Yeah, it's a rare Monday for me. I'm the March Thompson Show. I had to wake up a little earlier than than normal. Thank you. I, I appreciate you. Um, happy birthday, Draymond Green, Peter's saying. Is that right? Is it oh, Draymond's wow. uh, yeah, birthday, happy birthday today? Happy birthday, Draymond. We are um, uh, a radio show from the Bay Area that moved to YouTube. And so we have very close ties to the Bay Area. And sadly, I mean, I love that I could just say happy birthday, Draymond Green, but I can't do that without acknowledging that the Warriors were blown out in a oh. an absolute gangland slaying last night or yesterday. I think it was like 83 to 30 something at halftime. It was terrible on national TV, by the way. It was the third biggest points victory by the Celtics in their history. Um. Celtics Happy are good. Birthday, yeah. What? Yeah, but yeah. Happy birthday, uh, Draymond. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, Kamish, um, 
here's a question about Mark's madness from Julie. Kamish Albert, I hope you put Clarence Thomas's drop for March Madness in there. Uh, now, that's the I come from regular stock, uh, I believe. Is it a. I think there's a series of them, right? There's a few of them that you. Oh, there may drop. be. Yeah. I come from regular stock. Yeah. Do you, so. Again, just to remind everybody, we won't spend too long on this, but it is important because it is coming up. All these drops will play off against each other. So the Clarence Thomas drop, I've uh, come from regular stock. I've come from will, regular stock. Will play off against a another drop, and you'll uh, the audience vote. Only one will go on to the next round. Um, Albert, what is happening? You are going to preview what the drops are that will be appearing in Mark's Madness. Yeah, so I'm going to share it here on the screen for those who, to to view. And then post-show, I'm going to post it in the comment section. So if you have any opinions on what you think I omitted from the list or do you think some some drops should be a little ranked higher, please put your feedback in there, and I will consider them. This is an extraordinary thing that the commissioner's office is announcing, and maybe in a sense this is a major announcement on the Mark Thompson oh, show. Albert is Albert as commissioner unprecedented he is taking audience input to help craft what will be the ultimate showdown in Mark's Madness so those that you see 30 separate drops they're on the screen now and if you don't know what they are there's another thing that we're going to do we're going to drop a separate video with all of those drops that ultimately will be in Mark's Madness and you'll be able to hear them all. But what he's announcing today is, give us your thoughts about those drops, and you're saying you'll take them into consideration, Kamish. Yes, for the seating, and of course, there's only 30. There should be 32. The last two will be in our play-ins that will, that will start on Wednesday. This Wednesday, March This 6th. Wednesday, there yep. will be a play-in. That means, just like in NCAA tourney March Madness, there'll be a play-in two will go against each other and only one will get into the actual 32 and then there'll be another play in for the second hour of the show we do a two-hour show and that second one will get in and then that will be your 32 is that correct commish that is correct and then once our 32 are set our marks madness will officially start the following wednesday so the wednesdays are the most most important days of the week for this tournament Play-ins on this Wednesday, next Wednesday, the official start of Mark's Madness 2024. Mm. It's interesting. Some of the drops that are being suggested, we have had, their, I'd almost consider them legacy drops, but they aren't in the Mark's Madness list. And Julie, who clearly follows this stuff pretty closely, she says, I also love You Get Nothing. Yeah, mm -hmm. There are a lot that we love, and not all of them could make it. Um. Unfortunately not, and we're trying. There's a lot more newer drops here, and some some odd, like less used. But like you said, we're gonna have a separate video, so you could actually put some context. I think there might be some on there on the thirty right now. You, you're not sure of so. Like I can see right now uh, at twenty two, a a favorite of ours, but it really almost is never used. Right? Is that the uh, cheaper better? You yes, know? Um, is one of my personal faves, but I don't. Yeah, I think that really just lands with Albert as uh, as something that he. Two nice qualities, cheaper and better. Yeah. So, some of your favorites, some that you don't know so well. I think I already it's saw going some to... chit chit chits should be a little higher, maybe. So Kim's drop, um, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe chit -chit she's currently yeah. at seed number nine. Yeah, and I would say chit 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 has a chance to go very deep. That's why it's seeded. Again, this is a seeding. This is a potential seeding. So the ones at the top are ones that have performed well. Ones at the bottom are either ones that have never appeared before or ones that we kind of expect, you know, may not have the oomph to make it all the way. Oh, yeah, Saudi Arabia pays cash. I do love that one. Damn. Yeah, that one just missed the, just missed yeah. the turn. Saudi Arabia yeah. pays cash. Yeah. Like I said, oh. put all your feedback in the comment section with uh, just reply to these rankings, and I will consider them. Yeah. Try it. Again, get in touch with the commissioner's office here. I mean, this is an unprecedented access to an office that typically uh, is unreachable, unassailable, much like the Supreme Court that is making news today. I mean, Albert is our 
kind of SCOTUS. But now he's saying, hey, in an egalitarian way, he's throwing open the doors. And he's I do saying, take bribes, so if you want to give me an RV <laughs> or something like that, I'm, I'm all for that. Um, egalitarian's a ding word. Uh, Becky says, I always like the ones that came from the show, straight up, right in. Yep. Yeah. We discussed we straight that. up right in. We, yeah. we talked about that off air, and uh, it's just one of those legacy drops that kind of. Uh, yeah. But that's a really great old school drop, and those who are new probably don't know it, but we had a call. Straight up right in, no problem. That was a guy who was talking about David his. David Chico, yeah, that was David Chico. David Chico's Chico talking about his colonoscopy. Yeah. And how it was no big deal. And he literally said. Straight up right in, no problem. Uh, yeah. Um, I think he said they did it without much anesthesia. Or I, I forget. It was really an extraordinary thing. But he's very that we... enthusiastic about it. Oddly, it was very <laughs> odd. Yeah, straight up, right in, no problem. <laughs> he was great. He was a great character on the show. Um, anyway, the one, the woman who said she was so disappointed. Oh yeah, that's Shirley, of course. Um, that drop is not in uh i think one of the reasons that drop is not in yes i'm very unhappy with everything i've heard today on your show is because it uh well i have to ask the commissioner but um we really don't use it much we used to used to be at the top of every show the second hour it actually comes from nikki's show that caller was not to our show but when we heard it we said, we want that drop because it's just so great. Yes, I'm very unhappy <laughs> with everything I've heard today on your show. And we started the second hour of the radio show with that over. It was music was playing, but that was in there. Yeah, yeah Shirley's been in the tournament be tournament before. She can't get out of the first round. So she is. Uh, sorry, we'll, Shirley. We'll give another drop not, of that same yeah. treatment to be yeah. internally locked in the first round. It is uh Quit picking on Brett. Sure, that's one of them. But I, you know, these it's really like picking between children. You know, which ones do you love the most? I, I just don't. I just don't know what we can do. Um, so we. I mean, again, these are good. These are and and Albert has been uh, responsive. You know, to your uh, your queries and to your demands. So. In this way, he's opening the commissioner's doors open, uh, 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 wide open. He's opening the, he's opening the openness. He's, uh, he's taking the openness to a new uh, opening. <laughs> All right, uh, Albert, thank you for being here. Do we have any other business? I forget. Nope, that's it. We're okay. just gonna have to. Uh, after we review this, we're gonna have all the drops for you on uh, sometime uh, this week. We'll drop them as a separate video, separate so everybody video. will have a chance to listen to them. Going, I don't know what that one is. You'll have a chance to. So, uh, uh, Albert, thank you, Kamish. This is your time. This is your Super Bowl. This is Mark's Madness. Thank you, Kamish, Commissioner Albert. Everybody. Wow. Man, he is, uh, he's got a lot on his plate. It's very impressive, actually. The Mark Thompson Show. I kind of love this uh, time of year, but it's uh, a lot to keep track of, believe it or not. Um, Albert is open and taking bribes. Exactly. I love that he is, uh, um, he is, uh, he's very honest about the fact that he can be bought. I guess that's the, uh, <laughs> sure. It's the it was the oddest admission. I didn't expect it, but apparently, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, super sticker from Wes. Big shout Big out, shout Wes. Out. Thank you for always being a supporter, Wes. I hope you'll get, and we'll have a video. I hope you'll get the brackets, and you'll fill out your bracket, and we'll have a video showing you how to get the brackets. So don't worry, there'll be separate videos to explain that. I'm doing um, a bracket this year. You're gonna do one. I love it. Well, you're a big part. I mean, Kim, you're a chit chit chit, chit, chit may win it. I mean, it would be ironic if you were to not have one. So I'm glad you'll have one. But if the, you're in, if your yeah. if your drop is in, sh is it a conflict of interest for me to participate? <laughs> no, most certainly not. On the Mark's Madness, there's no such thing as a conflict of interest oh. on this show. On Mark's Madness, a uh, portions redacted asks: Is a drop a good thing that I want to keep or a bad thing? That I want to have go away. I never understand what we're voting for. Mm. Uh, this is a good question. We use the word drop because it's a sound drop what? that comes from outside and it drops into the show. Thompson, party of four. That would be a drop, right? 
And the reality is it's a good thing. You want to go on to the next round. So if you like one drop more than another, then you voted on to the next round. The science is ridiculous. Thank you. Like that, you would vote on to the next round if you like that more. Where's Thompson Party of Four from? uh, It's from a commercial that used to run on KGO all the time. And it was weird that they used the name Thompson Party of Four. They They used the name Thompson. And it was and it was right at the end of the spot. And I said to John Daly, let's lift that. It's just too good. Yeah. So that's how it got in. Let's go. Chit, 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 says Luis. I know. Right. Chit, chit, chit. I, Kim, I think your chit, chit, chit could really rock the show this year. I'm we'll hopeful. See. I'm hopeful. Happy my birthday, says Winthrop. Big shout Come out. Come on, Winthrop. <laughs> Happy birthday. You got a SCOTUS decision today. Isn't that you'll always remember this birthday for the corrupt Supreme Court decision. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. I almost will cannot cry, but Winthrop, happy birthday, my friend. So great. Thank you for a $10 super sticker, too. And um, now, let's get into just a couple of things that are going on um, news-wise. The Mark Thompson Show. Well, the uh, decision by the Supreme Court is not a surprise. And, in fact, um, one might look at the fact that it was 9-0 as something that is significant, and what do we take from that? In other words, were all the justices in agreement? They are barring states from removing Trump from the ballot for reasons uh, that he was behind and leading an insurrection, right? So um, essentially they're saying, the states have no power, that that power exists in Congress. Mm -hmm. And the power to essentially remove any candidate rests with a congressional vote, not with a decision in the states. Even as we talk about how the states have the power over the vote, the states have the power over their own elections, the federal ruling... The SCOTUS ruling will trump that, will go above that. There it is in the Wall Street Journal headline, Supreme Court restores Donald Trump's ballot eligibility. Justices reverse Colorado ruling that disqualified Trump for his role in the Capitol attack. So you have a a house that is never going to agree to kick Trump off the ballot, right? Regardless of what happened on January 6th. So what it tells me is that there is no repercussions no consequences for that that we as america don't take seriously what happened on january 6th is that i mean am i am i not understanding well, i mean that? I, I understand that i understand the way in which you asked that question they since congress can't get anything done they're essentially saying you know there's just no way that trump will be removed or mm-hmm. and and essentially in your question implicit in your question certainly is the notion that This was an extraordinary circumstance. This guy did lead and foment an insurrection. And for that reason, he should be removed from the ballot. I mean, it seems like it's a defensible position. And it wasn't just Colorado that was pursuing it. But SCOTUS is saying, yeah, you can't. I mean, it was a a civil war by now. We've discussed it a million times, a post-civil war um, aspect of the kind of constitutional defense against insurrectionists getting back into power. But what they're essentially saying is, uh, look, they're a handpicked court. They're saying there is uh, only one way to remove someone from the ballot, and that would be with Congress. Now, I did want to touch on, and I just think uh, Norma Eisen is so good. Uh, Tony, do you have a little bit of that video of his analysis on CNN? Because he makes one other point, and that's on the unanimity with which they made this decision and what can be read into that. What's implied? I mean, can we read anything into it? So here's a little bit of that. Do you have it, Tony, or not? Yeah. Uh, here it is, a little bit of a normalizing from about an hour ago on CNN. Go ahead. In a unanimous ruling, the court said Trump can remain on the ballot for the Republican presidential primary in Colorado. The court struck down an attempt to keep him from running for allegedly taking part in an insurrection. 
CNN legal analyst Norman Einstein uh, joins us now. Uh, Norman, in her opinion, Justice Amy Coney Barrett underscored the unanimity of the decision in, and I quote her here, this politically charged uh, issue in the volatile season of a presidential election case. How significant will it be to the American people that this was a unanimous decision? I couldn't believe these shocking... You're kidding me. Uh, really? <sighs> it's so weird when you when they uh, drop that ad in. It will be significant that the decision was unanimous in two regards. First, because it establishes that the road to disqualification of uh, insurrectionist candidates for president or other federal offices runs through the United States Congress. Uh, that's something that I and others had pointed to in advance as one of the most likely off-ramps here. So uh, in that regard, very important. But there's a second extremely important unanimous aspect of this opinion that's not being noticed, Becky. They did not explicitly deny the lower court findings that Donald Trump was an insurrectionist. Multiple fact finders have reached mm. that conclusion. Indeed, if you look at the evidence, the January 6th committee, Colorado, Maine, Illinois, have all found that, and that was not expressly overturned. And indeed, the three Democratic justices pointed to it in their concurrence. So in a sense, they have left the question open for the criminal authorities and for the American people what to do about Donald Trump's allegedly criminal conduct. There you go. Thank you. That was um, uh, the breakdown. I mean, it's pretty straightforward, but I thought the second part was a, a little bit of a wrinkle that you don't hear about. And that was from Norm Eisen, of course. So uh, it overturns Colorado, and that would have removed Trump from the ballot there, and it's full speed ahead. And of course, Trump, no surprise, uh, turns it into a win for America, of course. And, uh, you know, now it's the way it should be. And, you know, look, uh, Trump talks about this will unify the country more. I mean, it was so weird. I listened to his remarks to, to hear him talk about unification. I mean, this guy who is the most divisive figure probably in modern history uh, in, in the in a presidential political race anyway. And uh, it, it, there's an absurdist notion to this, and yet it's totally predictable. You know, he he's installed these uh, justices. This was a defensible position. We talked about the fact, I talked about the fact, you'll remember David Katz came on and said, Mark, I, you know, when you talked about the fact that it would be uh, precedent setting in a bad way to begin removing candidates from state ballots, that might be something that you could hang a decision on. That's exactly what they did, you know, in oral arguments anyway. We heard a lot of that in oral arguments. That was the time that David Katz was on around the oral arguments surrounding this case. But again, this 13 page opinion, um, essentially echoed a lot of those concerns. So that's pretty huge uh, in, it was, in that it's much anticipated. And then the other thing I would just say, just because we're talking about Trump and justice, you know, in what's called the documents case, it's really an espionage case. You understand the documents removed from the White House? These are top secret documents stored in publicly accessible areas at Mar-a-Lago in bathrooms, in ballrooms, hmm. then also in the bedroom, in the closet, well, I mean, really, in his what office. You, what else are you going to keep in your ballroom? I That's mean, true. That's true. It's kind of this empty space unless you're really having the ball. You know, you know it's, it's empty most, most, most of the time. So Kim's right. I mean, it's underrepresented as a place where you could store documents. Yeah. You never really hear, you know, it is when you look at that all that space, like, hey, man, when they're not balling, you know, in the ballroom, they can be storing Absolutely. stuff in the, you know. So yeah. anyway, uh, that case looks to be <laughs> a, a July 22nd date, I believe. But now the judge there, who is a total Trumpy, has said she's skeptical about that being a date that they could legitimately start 
that trial. So, and she's playing right to Trump because she knows if and when he wins the presidency, he'll bump her up, right? She'll she'll get up to the appellate court. She's going to be well taken care of by a Trump administration. So, um, anyway, that's a little bit of what is happening uh, in that world. The Mark Thompson Show. I have... Um, uh, true crime crime corner awaiting. I also want to hear from you, uh, Kim. I'll just mention one thing because I think it's historic and important. France has voted to make access to abortion a constitutional right. It is, um, and the Eiffel Tower lit up in Paris to mark the change. It's a way of protecting a law that decriminalized abortion. That happened in 1975. But this is a huge guaranteed freedom in France. Thunderous applause in the chamber as this result was announced in central Paris. The Eiffel Tower illuminated, as you see there. And look how different they're doing it in France than we're doing it here. Look what's happening. How countries, sad. two countries mm -hmm. going in different directions. Yeah. So... Uh, smash the like button like a boss. Give us a thumbs up smash if you would. It helps us in the algorithms rod. of YouTube. Uh, True Crime Corner, we have a special guest yeah. joining us in True Crime Corner. So I'll ask the special guest to have a cup of coffee, wait for a minute or two, and uh, Kim's news, and then we get True Crime Corner with Courtney yeah. and a special guest it's as we continue. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a great one. Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. On the Mark Thompson Show, I'm Kim McAllister, and this report sponsored by CoachellaValleyCoffee.com. As Mark mentioned, he's taken a victory lap. Former President Trump says he wants President Biden to try to beat him in the upcoming election and not in court. Speaking after his Supreme Court victory, they call it he calls it a Supreme Court victory in the Colorado ballot case, Trump accused Biden of weaponizing the Department of Justice against him. The high court unanimously ruled today states cannot remove Trump from the ballot. The largest wildfire in Texas history may have been started by a fallen utility pole. Mm, the number of lawsuits and property insurance claims allege that Excel Energy failed to inspect and repair their equipment. Flames have torched more than one million acres of land and have caused the deaths of at least two people. Uh, we are getting ready for President Biden's State of the Union address. He will deliver it on Thursday. A preview of the speech says the president will outline how he's making the wealthy pay their fair share. He'll also push other policies that could pick up support from both sides of the aisle, like helping veterans and fighting cancer as well. So what a weekend in the Tahoe area. Yeah, it's a heavy snow, making some California highways impassable and creating life-threatening conditions around the Lake Tahoe area. One wind gust clocked it up to 190 miles per hour. More than 100 miles of Interstate 80 remained closed yesterday from the Nevada border. Uh, many travelers reportedly trapped in their vehicles for hours. And I don't feel bad for you because all of you were warned. Don't go out on the roads. Don't do that. And look what you did. You got stuck right in the middle of a blizzard. Come so true. Now. I mean, they, they couldn't have People. been stronger with the, with the warnings. Right? I yeah. mean, and here we go anyway with people. And you know what happens? Somebody has to come out there and rescue you, putting them in danger as well. Please. This is off JetBlue and Spirit calling off merger plans. It comes after the, a federal judge blocked the $3.8 billion agreement. The judge agreeing with the Department of Justice's argument that the merger would reduce competition and hurt consumers as well. So we don't get a, a, a JetBlue and Spirit merger after all. And that is the way that goes. Did you hear about the tornado in the Central Valley? I mean, I guess you can't say it's a new one because this type of thing has happened before. But it's pretty spectacular nonetheless. A tornado reported in the Central Valley Friday afternoon as thunderstorms passed through the region. It happened uh, just after 3.30 in the afternoon in the community of Madeira Aries in Madera County, right off Highway 99. The uh, National Weather Service had to issue a tornado warning for California's Central Valley. 
This is just so rare. Insane. The conditions were there for this to happen, according to the National Weather Service. We saw convection forming at the time the tornado occurred. Tornadoes are rarely seen, they say, but they're not out of the question, particularly on strong storm days or on days with a larger chance from, for thunderstorms. So nobody hurt there, but uh, quite a show. It does happen, but it, that's still extraordinary. I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. quite, quite extraordinary. And it is official. We now know that Jason Kelsey is retiring from football. I heard he broke down in tears as he made the announcement. Mm, yeah, it's sad. I mean, it's such a big part of his life and his family's life and everything else. But he is retiring from football, making the announcement today at a news conference in Philadelphia. He, of course, was drafted in 2011 in the sixth round of the NFL draft by the Eagles. And he played 13 seasons for that team. I don't know. You have to tell me, is 13 seasons that's in the a, NFL a good thing? I mean, is yeah. that a lot? Is that well, it, normal? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's really great. He played at an immensely high mm. level. I mean, it was, he's and a really great player. the same team. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, he did help the team win Super Bowl 52. Mm-hmm. Right? So he's yeah, got and, that. And again, this, if you're just listening, this is the Kelsey mm -hmm. brother, not the one not, who plays for the Chiefs, the one who plays yeah. for the Eagles. Is, uh, Kim yeah, this noted. is Jason. Right. Jason, the older brother. But I guess, would we be talking about him if his brother Travis wasn't dating Taylor Swift? I don't know. I'm guessing not. No. Well, I, I, it's not. I, 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 we would be talking about him because he, we were talking about him before he started dating Travis. But it's because his brother's a superstar. His brother's yeah. a very high-profile superstar on commercials, et cetera. That's one of the reasons. But, yeah. but you're right. The Taylor Swift thing just vaulted to another level. Yeah. And it made, it made their whole family famous. The mother even, too. So... Um, lastly, I will tell you that, as expected, Dune 2 totally took over the box office. I mean, this thing, this maybe it's because no one else wanted to go against it, and so there really wasn't anything else at the movie theater to people for people to, to dig into. But yeah, Dune... Oh, that's not the right thing. Sorry. Dune 2 is providing a major boost to the box office. The sequel made $81.5 million in its debut weekend in North American theaters. And that is the largest opening since Five Nights at Freddy's in October. Bob Marley, One Love, came in second place with Hilary Swank's Ordinary Angels finishing third in weekend ticket sales. And this report is sponsored by Coachella Valley Coffee Dot com. I'm drinking today the vanilla tea. Mm. Mm, it's really good and tasty. It's got, it's not, it doesn't have any sugar, but it just has this hint of vanilla. It's really, really delicious. So, uh, Courtney this just was, loves the teas. Yeah. I love the coffee. It's really, yeah. really good. Yeah. I can't help myself. Uh, yeah. It is, as I like to say, a little bit of heaven in your Mark Thompson coffee cup. So you can find this huge selection of coffees and amazing teas, a treat. Absolutely just for you, CoachellaValleyCoffee.com. And when you go there and click around, please make sure that at checkout you enter Mark T all together, Mark T to get your exclusive 10% off at CoachellaValleyCoffee.com. Mm. I'm Kim McAllister. This is The Mark Thompson Show. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Shadow Stevens. This is The Mark Thompson Show. Keep it to yourself. Who's Mark Thompson? What up, everybody? It's a significant day. Monday, we touched on some of the news. Mondays, though, we jump into, by the way, if you notice the red light, which is a new, um, I don't, apparently it's, um, uh, the entire place is getting a little bit uh, tweaked. And the Tony and um, Jefferson Graham were up here and they've kind of begun tweaking it. So they've added a red light, Courtney. I don't know if it. Uh, yeah, I was yeah. wondering. So I hope our like, guest is not put off by the red light. I mean, warning, don't, um, get out. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, the lighting looks good. Yeah, the lighting. They came it up. Does. They came up in here like a like a lighting SWAT team and yeah. they brought all these lights. It was really quite a Tony, That's when scary. he really. He's insane. He brings it. I got that in my house. I got this in my house. I'll bring this. I'll bring that. He's got He really is amazing. So anyway, yeah. uh, we have that. But uh, I've delayed enough. On Monday as we do it, it's True Crime Corner. Let's pay a visit to Mark's True Crime Corner. This is not a good neighborhood. I'm scared. Now, here's your host, Mark Thompson. Largely because I know nothing about true crime and I have only marginal interest in true crime. 
I uh, <laughs> I bring in uh, my other half, Courtney, everyone, who is Hi. lovely. And Thank today, you. Courtney, we have a real uh, I know. impressive guest. I this know. is a true crime author. He's also a Bay Area kid, which I really like. This show was born in the Bay Area, Doug. I don't know if you're aware of that. But uh, Doug Carey, everybody. Um, we were a KGO radio show that moved to YouTube, Doug. So you are, um, well, you're connected to us, whether you realize it or not, because we feel very connected to the Bay Area. And I know you, you know, your education. Uh, um, I think you went to, did you go to Cal or something? I thought that was what I read in your bio. I did go to Cal, yeah. yeah, and don't hold it against me. I went to law school in the Bay Area too, and I was aware of your origins on KGO, which is a very yeah. popular radio station in the Bay Area. And yeah. he still agreed to come. <laughs> How dare you, Courtney? <laughs> How dare you insult me in front of the guest? Uh, you write beautifully and in a detailed way about true crime, Doug. And your book, The Berman Murders, is the focus of what we're talking about today. The, uh, it's, and, the, and the subtitle is Unraveling the Mojave Desert's Most Mysterious Unsolved Crime. Yes. Courtney, you really, really sparked to this, didn't you? Yes, it was a story I wasn't familiar with, and it's a, it's a fascinating story. And Doug spent so much time investigating uh this disappearance and so well there's I'm keen to ha yeah there's money in this there's an mm -hmm. heir to a fortune in it there's a woman who's missing doug take us through this a little bit if you would the berman murders i was drawn to the story because of the location mark and courtney saline valley in southeastern california is one of the most remarkable and isolated places, probably in all of the Western United States, even though it's only a couple of hundred miles from Los Angeles. Getting in there is difficult just to begin with. Uh, you go on a, a two-lane highway towards Death Valley, and then if it's passable, take a 50-mile dirt road crossing over mountains into this pristine desert wilderness. And in the middle of this incomparable desert wilderness is an oasis that hippie types and eccentrics and desert travelers have developed into a, 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 a hot springs soaking place where you might drive up and see somebody just wearing a floppy hat, dark glasses and a pair of sandals and nothing else. Uh, but it's not a hookup kind of spot. It's more about getting getting back to nature than, than getting busy with other campers. And when this couple, Barry and Louise Berman, Barry, although they were rather unassuming hippie type folks, Barry was actually the heir apparent to the Kahlua liquor fortune. And they were going on a romantic makeup trip and they went to this hot springs oasis, got up in the morning and, and took a walk and never came back. And the... Uh... The weird crowd, I would say, I'm going to use the term weird, the eccentric crowd that uh, found this place and made it their own in large measure. Um, was there a buzz that someone was missing or what was the, uh, how did this thing bubble to the surface in terms of being a real investigative mystery? So I'm one of those weirdos uh, because <laughs> back when I was a student at Berkeley, I heard about this place and rallied a bunch of guys that I knew to go out there and check it out. And it was just amazing. And I got hooked into visiting and exploring that area. Now, my grandmother was one of these desert rats. She was a prospector. After my grandfather died, she moved to the Mojave Desert and had a little cabin with kerosene lanterns for light. She witched a well. She lived the rest of her life that way until age 88. I mean, she lived that reality. So you can imagine as a young boy, I was just enthralled with her and the idea of exploring the desert. And I became very connected to this area. I'll, I'll tell you, Mark and, and Courtney, when, when the Burmans disappeared, it absolutely rattled everybody who frequented this area. I mean, it's a fairly tight knit kind of a place. You might not know a person's real name because some of them were running from the law, but most people had a handle like Chili Bob or Major Tom. And 
when the Burmans disappeared, who were by all accounts, just a peaceful, unassuming kind of a couple, it just, everybody wondered what happened. And I was one of the people who wondered and speculated about what happened to them. And then almost three years later, miles away, their bodies turned up in a cut bank grave. It's, yeah. Go ahead, Courtney. I'm well, sorry. I was going to ask, uh, is that how they knew there was foul play, is the bodies being buried in the shallow graves? Foul play became a, a premise pretty early on in the case, Courtney, because it's difficult for two people to just vanish off the face of the earth. Now, this isn't a wooded area like the Appalachia Trail or something. This is an, an area where it's pretty wide open and the search for them especially because of who Barry's father was, was just massive. There was largest search in Inyo County history. And in addition, there was a private search. There were aerial assets brought to bear. I'm talking Stockton National Guard, the CHP, the Naval Base in Ridgecrest, California. All these helicopters, fixed wing aircraft came in and then searchers from surrounding counties, Mono County, Inyo County, et cetera, coming in to scour the landscape and not a trace turned up. So oh. pretty early on, the Inyo County Sheriff's Department started thinking, this isn't right. Something doesn't seem right here. It's it's likely that this is foul play. And when their bodies were found, that absolutely cemented it. It's interesting to me, Doug, maybe you can tell me with all of those assets in play that you just described, how is it that their bodies are missing for so long? It's a good question. And a couple of things on that, because that's something I really pondered. Uh, I mean, Mark, you've just hit one of the core elements of the investigation. Why didn't they find the bodies? A couple of things. The Burmans left camp on foot and their bodies were found about seven long miles away. And, and if you've done wilderness stuff like I've done all my life, a mile in the wilderness isn't like walking a mile in the city to go to the grocery store. First of all, although the road looks somewhat level, it's actually an upslope that's quite significant. And so the Burmans not only were found seven miles away, but they were found uphill elevation-wise, a measurable distance. This would have been a stout hike for anybody to leave camp and go that seven miles, let alone if it was going to be a round trip. And given that Louise was a middle-aged woman, she was quite a bit older than her husband, Barry, and she had been reported to have a sore ankle. Uh, investigators just didn't think in terms of that kind of distance. So that was one factor. Another factor was that they really relied on just scouring the area as a whole, more thinking in terms of search and rescue than looking for where a body might have been secreted. Had they thought more in those terms, they might have thought, well, let's follow the wheel tracks. Had they gone further up that road and explored different wheel tracks, I think it's possible they could have found the bodies. And then the third thing is whoever buried them did a heck of a job of concealing the bodies. Well, as it turns out, you guys can tell me, I guess it was part of a, I mean, they, they ultimately tie this to, um, and, I, and I, in a way I don't want to pay this off until uh, I ask you about your method, but I will pay it off. And then I want to go back and ask you about your method because it's really unorthodox, Doug. You have a really great way of investigating the investigations in, in effect. Um, but ultimately it, it was tied to something that maybe you wouldn't have connected them to. So very early on investigators were puzzled because there aren't that many people that go into this area where these hot springs are that I described. And, and there's one main area of hot springs called the lower warm springs. And that's pretty much the social scene. Then you've got a couple of bathing pools that are three quarters of a mile uphill up the road. And that's where the Burmans had been camped. Only a few people would normally go up to that camp at that time of year. And the, the people who go up there tend to be more back to the nature, back to nature types. And so it was 
pretty easy to kind of look around and say, well, who are the people that are likely suspects? And there was one guy who was traveling alone and had been seen driving his little pickup truck up the same road where the Burmans went that morning on a morning hike. And the question arose, well, what's his story? We need to talk to him and eliminate him as a suspect. But the case just, the circumstantial evidence against him just grew from there. How did they find that guy in the pickup? What a story. Uh, Investigators had no idea who he was. They only knew his first name was Mike, and they had heard that he might be in the military. He was a military man, young fellow traveling alone. There was a deputy, Leon Boyer, with the Inyo County Sheriff's Office. Wasn't formally assigned to the case, but it just really stuck in his craw. He's a part-time deputy, a rancher, one of those just down-to-earth kind of guys. And he felt strongly that something wasn't right about this this camper. And he was determined to find him. So he started taking vacations into Saline Valley. And he actually made a composite drawing based on what witnesses had said about a description of this camper. And he was ultimately able to identify him. And investigators then went and questioned him. What a almost literary detail that there's one guy who it just sticks in his craw. I mean, it's like you've seen it a million times in film and you've read it a million times in various uh, books about any kind of wrongdoing. There's one that just doesn't make sense. There's something going on here. And then that guy determined, I mean, what extraordinary work he did to, you know, produce this uh, composite drawing and ultimately, you know, nail the suspect And so what do we find out? So when investigators start looking into this fellow, and by the way, his driver's license photo and even later photos of him are just remarkable likenesses compared to compared to the composite drawing that Leon Boyer did. It's amazing work. So they ran his information, of course. And what they found out was that indeed he was in the military. He was a a captain actually in the U.S. Marine Corps, stationed at a logistics base in Barstow. So investigators decided, listen, let's spring an interview on him. We're not going to tell anybody we're coming. We will coordinate with uh, Naval Investigative Service and we'll go out there and see what he has to say. Will he talk to us? Will he answer questions? This was about 10 months after the Bermans disappeared. At that point, no bodies had been found. It was still a missing person case. He was a a possible suspect. They were thinking maybe foul play, but they didn't know. He might have some innocent explanation. Who knows? Maybe he could shed light. Maybe he had seen him hiking into an isolated area and, you know, somehow their remains had been overlooked by by searchers, who knows? So they go to the, the, the logistics base. They sit down in a conference room with a tape recorder and the commanding general, because it turns out that Michael Pepe, the suspect, is actually the adjunct to the commanding general. He gets sent in and told some people want to talk to him. They identify themselves as investigators and he could have lawyered up, but he doesn't. Instead, he sits down They click on the tape recorder and they start asking questions. And what's revealed is, uh, again, this connection that um, there's a lot here. I mean, we're just kind of skipping it. It's such it's such a detailed and rich story, isn't it, Courtney? Yes. Um, But what's revealed is is a connection that one wouldn't imagine. So later. After they're unable to develop enough evidence to charge him, he ends up retiring from the Marine Corps, moving to Cambodia, renting, using his Marine Corps retirement money, renting a beautiful villa in this impoverished country and setting up shop as a trafficker in young women for his own personal enjoyment. When I say young women, I don't really mean women. I mean children aged 9 to 12 years old that he was bringing in not just as slaves to his own purient desires, but literally to torture. And in my view, looking back as an investigative journalist, thinking, well, what kind of a person 
might have committed that crime back in Saline Valley. The investigators at the time thought, we think it was probably some sort of sexual deviant. Well, here you've got one. Wow. 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 And indeed, um, there's kinkiness all over the place in this story, as it turns out. Even as you began to investigate and, and reveal details, um, you speak to those who are close to investigators and find out some details that kind of fall into that category? Well, there, there were so many twists and turns in the case, but one of the twists that was, again, just a remarkable example of poor judgment, the lead ICE investigator, because ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, enforces laws and investigates trafficking overseas. What what he was doing in this villa in Cambodia, even though it's a corrupt country where they tend to turn a blind eye to that kind of thing, what he was doing was so extreme, so off the charts, that both the Cambodian government and ICE got involved. And he got brought back to the United States to be tried under federal charges. And when that happened, it turned out that right during the trial, the lead ICE investigator started having an affair with the interpreter, one of the interpreters, who's supposed to be unbiased, in an unbiased manner interpreting the testimony of the children. The judge was furious, and this prompted a, a, a huge investigation as they looked to see, oh my gosh, was she spinning the testimony in favor of the government because she was sleeping with the lead investigator. I mean, just you wild. Can't, you can't just, make this stuff up. Yeah, it really is wild. And how, when you're talking to all of these people, you get to, you really have some revelations here that you got, you know, in your conversations. How do you get them to trust you or have faith in you or, you know, have confidence that you're going to represent the story accurately or what, even as they reveal some of these details that are, are really pretty brutal? I think persistence has a lot to do with it, Mark. I, because I worked on the story for so long, I, I worked on it for nine years. There was a cover story in LA Weekly. I published articles about the case in various places while I was working on the book. And I think as I started building a reputation as somebody who knew a lot about the story and I kept coming back, people who were initially reluctant to me just decided to, at a certain point just to, to talk. Does, and there it is, the uh, LA Weekly with the double murder in the Mojave on the um on the cover and you do i mentioned this before and so now let me double back and pick it up and pay it off you do have a style as an investigator yourself because that's really what you're doing you're investigating and writing uh that is different than a lot of those who investigate and write it's an immersive style is what it's called that's true and it's because i feel that there's an unoccupied niche in true crime. I mean, there's a lot of good work. I don't want to claim I'm the only one who, who does this, but I really believe there's room in true crime for people who go into great depth and who offer detail. I want to tell a good story, but I also want it to, to be a, a rigorously told story in the sense that it's backed by research into every possible angle to the point when I went to look for the grave site and it took me a couple of visits into this remote area. I'm just getting there. To be in the general vicinity is itself quite an adventure. But I'm an I'm I'm an experienced desert explorer. I'm an experienced mountaineer. So none of that was very daunting to me. But actually finding the gravesite was difficult. And then I found it, and it was exactly as it was in the photos from the time. But when I did find it, I I wanted to kind of try to feel what happened there. It's a beautiful spot, as you can see in the photo, and this lonely kind of windswept spot. How did it feel? What what was going on when these murders occurred? I ended up just lying in the grave on my back, looking up at the sky and trying to imagine what took place there. I mean, that is, it gives me chills just to think of that, that somebody who's again, so immersed, to use the word again, in this investigation as you write about it, actually was lying in the graves that were the last resting place of these two people. There are questions that are showing up in the chat I'm just seeing 
one of which is related to, uh, it's always about the money somehow, the Kahlua heir, who ultimately, and again, this is a fortune and lived in Beverly Hills, etc. Um, who ultimately, what happened to that money is what's being asked. I don't, do you know the answer that's, to that question? I do. And that's such a great question because to me, it underscored the tragedy of this case. Barry was the only child of Jules and Ruth Berman. And when, when he died, it just devastated the parents. Barry was so different from his dad. His dad was this mega deal maker. And Barry was the disciple of a Punjabi guru. He lived a simple life. He was a craftsman who crafted iron with his hands. His father didn't understand him and he didn't understand his father. Yet there was this love between them. And when he uh, was murdered, it just devastated the father and mother, absolutely devastated them. And this massive fortune that they had built just sort of, it just sort of, you know, goes away. I mean, listen, it, it went to good purposes. It went to various charities. He had a big collection of artwork. Now and then something comes up for auction. Things just kind of went away. Uh, but to me, it underscored a bit the the transient nature of materialism because the here was Jules Berman. Everything he touched, it was like a Midas story. It seemed like everything he touched, whether it was the liquor business, Kahlua, real estate, oil, just turned into wealth beyond our wildest imaginations, really. Yet the one thing that he really cherished the most, as it turned out, his, his only child. When his only child left, he was really just died a shattered man and the wealth just went back into the universe. Yeah. It's, a, it's an extraordinary thing and an incredibly... Uh, extraordinary tale from uh, as we finish up with, with you, Doug, from start to finish, how long did the whole thing take? They went missing in 86, wasn't it? 86 is when they went missing. I didn't start digging into the case until 2014. I was aware of it at the time, but I didn't start really looking at it like I'm going to get into this story until 2014. And then off and on, I spent nine years on the case. It was a tough project. It was hard getting information and it was a very challenging case. Just the physical location where they disappeared, it's tough to get to. Everything about the case was, was difficult. It took me a long time. But in the end, I got some really interesting information and I'll, I'll tickle you a little bit, including some jailhouse informants, including a, a cellmate of the chief suspect. So a lot of things in the in the book about the the case against him but i have to also in fairness say he's never been charged he's never been arrested the case remains wide open in the eyes of the Inyo county sheriff's office even though you to be clear feel that all the breadcrumbs lead to him i do i went into it with an open mind i thought maybe investigators got it wrong i would have been happy to prove that they got it wrong. But in fact, the evidence leads in the direction of, of, of Pepe as being the perpetrator. And I present the theories, present the case. Readers are free to make their own conclusion. Again, the man's never been charged. And in fact, the district attorney felt, that despite all the evidence that was developed, that he just didn't have enough to pursue a verdict beyond a reasonable doubt. Again, the book is The Berman Murders, Doug Carey's True Crime Investigation and Description. And uh, he's a brilliant investigator and writer. So what a ride this is, The Berman Murders. I mean, there is so much here. And as you say, it's a um, twist and turn city. <laughs> Unraveling the Mojave Desert's most mysterious unsolved crime. You begin to see why it was unsolved for so long in... Um, in our conversation, Doug, I think you've brought some of that to life. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to a bunch of people in the uh, chat are saying they're, they can't wait to get the book. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing you continue to tell this story that you work so hard investigating. And Courtney, thank you for bringing Doug around today. Oh, well, uh, thank you. It was a really interesting story. And it was really nice to meet Doug and hear about his process. I hope I didn't. Do you have any outstanding questions? No, I mean, I'm, I'm actually really impressed. 
Um, yeah. And you're so. tough to impress on true crime. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I have a, a generally unimpressed. <laughs> yeah, she's generally unimpressed by everything, Doug. I mean, not just true crime. That that. Uh, but um, no, I, I um, it was really thoughtful question. So and it was a, it was really nice to hear from Doug about the story and and um, his journey through it. So great it's stuff. Available, uh, I think it ships tomorrow, right? So. The official release date is tomorrow. That's right. I love it. It's really well. That's terrific. We're part of the launch. That makes me feel even better. Well, good. Uh, Doug, this is a regular segment, and this is your beat, true crime. Please come visit again. Good luck with the book, The Berman Murders. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Courtney. Thank Doug you. Doug Carey, everybody. That's True Crime Corner for the day. True Crime Corner, only on The Mark Thompson Show. Oh, he's good, huh? Yeah. He's I mean, good. that is real journalism that he does. Yeah, I know. You know, it really. He's yeah. not just he's not just uh, turning on a podcast and throwing on a mic with a story. He, yeah, exactly. No, with a Nine, red light behind him. How dare you? <laughs> Nine years he spent looking into yeah. this. I mean, that's just it's incredible, insane commitment. It and, really is. Uh, insane focus. Really, really great. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was really interesting to read about the story, and um, and actually, there are forums that were talking about his process as well, and uh, some people that went to high school with Barry that were reminiscing about Barry, but also talking about uh, Doug's in in sort of investigative work around uh, what happened. So yeah, it's a yeah. tremendous commitment, really impressive. So. Yeah. Uh, smash the like smash button like a boss. With your iron yeah, rod. give us a thumbs up in the YouTube universe that helps us in the algorithm. Blah blah blah. You know the story. In our new YouTube world, <laughs> it is uh, so important. Courtney, great to see you always. Thank you for being part Thank of you. things, Thank Courtney. You for having me. Everyone, Thank you. yeah. Uh, you, Kim, I'm sorry. Well, I'm just impressed. It was a really great interview, Mark. No, he's yeah. really. Oh. I, well, thank you. You might have a future in this. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, um, I'm a big fan of. Uh, of people who have a good story to tell, and he's one of them, right? Yep. Uh, there is a poll out. You saw it. It was front page of the New York Times. I'll touch on that when we come back. I know the Supreme Court is making news. I want to double back to that because there's a fact. There's an ugly fact. Leave Trump and this case out in Colorado. Leave it out. And there's still an ugly fact to be discussed about the Supreme Court docket. And I'll get to that as well as we continue. Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. On The Mark Thompson Show, I'm Kim McAllister. This report sponsored by Tenuta Vineyards in Livermore. Donald Trump says he'd like President Biden to try it. Go ahead, beat him at the ballot box, not in the court. Speaking after his Supreme Court uh, victory in the Colorado ballot case, Trump accused President Biden of weaponizing the Department of Justice against him. He, by the way, is also coming out now, pivoting very quickly and talking about the immunity case, saying that they should rule for him in that case, too. Of course, taking this opportunity to, to discuss the uh, the next case coming down the pike. Yeah, on to the next one. Right. Yeah. Let's, get, let's get the assembly line of protecting right. Trump. Let's keep it going. Uh, the high court, of course, today ruled Colorado can't remove Trump over claims he was an insurrectionist. The decision effectively stops other states from trying to do the same. So the FAA's audit of Boeing has found multiple issues with the manufacturer's production practices. Are we surprised about this? I don't know. The six week investigation comes after this door plug you see here blew out on the Alaska Airlines flight in January. The FAA said in a press release that it found non-compliance issues in Boeing's manufacturing process, control, parts handling, and storage, and product control. Well, where did you not find a fault then, I guess? Other separate uh, reports released last month from before the door plug incident also said there were gaps in the company's safety culture, including fears in workers about retaliation for reporting safety concerns. So problems across the board at Boeing. So essentially they're saying if you blew the whistle internally, mm -hmm. they, they took actions against you. So there was not only negligence, but you were punished for bringing any attention to the negligence. I mean, that's really scary, don't you think? I mean, well, because uh, you I... have to count on your workers who are 
you know, creating the product to bring concerns to you? How will sure. you know that, you know, Joe down the row isn't screwing things in properly? Or you know what, Joe. You, that he... He, um, he comes to work a little, you know. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, it's a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's fantastic. Okay. Yeah, you never know. Um, let's talk about the attention on tomorrow's election that may be drawn to state and national races, but a Los Angeles County City Council contest is getting a little bit of attention as well. We remember Kevin DeLeon. Mm. He is the uh, councilman running for re-election after being entangled in a leaked conversation that was really kind of sprinkled with racist comments. De Leon has consistently said he refuses to step down from his 14th district office because he was elected to serve his East Los Angeles constituents. If De Leon garners enough votes to be in the top two spots against opponents Wendy Carrillo and Miguel Santiago, he will make it to the runoff election in November. So what will the voters in Los Angeles County do? Uh, garners is a ding word, please. Thank I'll you. Take it. Uh, let's talk about the race for California's U.S. Senate seat, vacated, of course, by the late Dianne Feinstein, with a new front runner, according to the latest poll. Last week, the Los Angeles Times gave former Dodger star Republican Steve Garvey 27 percent of the vote. That's two points ahead of Democrat Adam Schiff. Tracking ahead to November, the Times poll suggested the Burbank Democrat would handily beat Garvey head to head. Irvine Democrat Katie Porter has a uh, apparently dropped out of the pack in the same poll she comes away with 19 percent of the vote she has not dropped out of the race but her her ranking in the in the numbers are lower and so. i'll remind everybody this is the 3d chess of we're talking about the senate seat of course mm -hmm. vacated by diane feinstein this is the 3d chess that adam schiff was doing to essentially bump porter back by literally giving money and advertising for they did this through a pack of uh, Steve Garvey's, and, and it worked. Garvey leapt to the front, even in many polls. He's the leading candidate, as you just heard uh, from Kim. Mm -hmm. And uh, Schiff doesn't care because he can, you know, he can finish second. And if it's Garvey and Schiff, Schiff will carry the day. He wanted to get rid of his biggest competition, and that was Katie Porter. So his money was well spent, and it did work. And now you may like Adam Schiff. He's got a lot of very great qualities. He's courageous in the face of a lot of criticism with Donald Trump and that whole impeachment, et cetera. But I'm just suggesting that uh, that is the the politics of California that involved a big spend to boost Garvey and then to allow it to essentially be what will be no contest when the two face off, should it be that way but here's in the, the actual question. election. Did Adam Schiff think that he would, by doing so, he would actually raise Garvey above him in the polls? Probably, um, <laughs> Oops. I'm sure, probably not. But as I say, it doesn't matter yeah. because you only need to be one or two because right. then you'll go. So he, it really, it, it's a weird thing. Yeah. You know, the Garvey can enjoy a victory lap if he finishes first, mm -hmm. but for Schiff, it doesn't matter because yeah. when the actual you know, election comes, it mm -hmm. will, it will be, uh, it'll be a cakewalk. I mean, in, in a largely democratic state of California. In Marin County, there has been a fourfold increase in fentanyl-related overdose deaths in the last two weeks. It has Marin County health officials sending out a health advisory now. In the last two weeks alone, Marin County has seen five overdose deaths related to fentanyl. The county sent out an alert to local doctors and to providers who offer assistance to people who abuse drugs. The health advisory says since February 14th, it suspected the victims ingested fentanyl in combination with methamphetamine. According to the county, substances in wastewater have also increased, as have emergency calls for non-fatal overdoses. According to the Marin County Health Department, the increase may be due to increased concentration and intentional use of fentanyl or increased contamination of fentanyl in other substances. Drug overdoses, are now the leading cause of death in people under 55 in Marin County. That's big. There is some outrage going on over what's happening in uh, Kansas City, well, in Missouri. The governor of Missouri 
has commuted the sentence of former Kansas City Chiefs assistant Britt Reed for his DUI crash that injured six and left a young girl with brain damage. The 38-year-old Reed, who is the son of Chiefs head coach Andy Reed, pleaded guilty in November of 2022 to felony DUI for this crash that left a five-year-old girl in a coma and then with brain damage. Governor Mike Parson said Reed served more prison time than most individuals convicted of similar offenses and will serve the remainder of his sentence until 2025 on house arrest. The lawyer for the victims stunned after the commutation news. So, I mean, it's stunning. There's mm-hmm. no, I'm not, I'm not uh, surprised. It really is. I mean, c- considering that um, he destroyed the life of two people, right? He killed one person, I think he, and seriously injured another, or is it, was it just uh, the serious injury? I, I'm sorry, you mentioned it and I just... So, yeah, he, it was a... An, uh, Injuring of six people. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was an injuring of six people and leaving one of the injured as this five-year-old girl with brain damage. That's it. Okay. So there were no deaths, but there were six injured and some permanently injured. According to the story, this girl, five years old, will never be herself again. So he was driving 84 miles an hour Mm -hmm. on a 65 mile an hour road and his truck hit the cars on an entrance ramp. And that was, it was near Arrowhead Stadium, which is just kind of eerie. But um, his blood alcohol level um, was 0.113. The legal uh, limit is 0.08. So well over, anyway, uh, I'm just. He got a three year sentence for that. And now he doesn't have to serve it out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm uh, sure many people will be thinking that it's because of who he is, right? Yeah, now, he, it was the governor who had commuted it, right? Mm-hmm. Wasn't it the governor? Governor, or, I think, governor of Missouri, that's right. Right, it wasn't, I mean, uh, I don't know, is that a, uh, he shortened it, he didn't, it wasn't a commutation, it was a uh, It was a shortening of the sentence. It was a, it was a shortening and allowing of, of, of Mr. Reed here to serve the rest of it at home instead of in jail. This governor in Missouri, man, he has granted clemency to more people than any other Missouri governor since the 1940s. So he is like uh, Mr. Clemency guy, the governor in Missouri now. And you can just put this on the list of kind of legal actions he's taken that m- raised eyebrows and, and produced eye rolls. Anyway, mm-hmm. moving on. Waymo. Hmm. It's one approval to expand its robo-taxi service. The autonomous vehicle maker can now add to its fleet in Los Angeles as well as in San Francisco. The approval from the California Public Utilities Commission comes despite the concerns of critics about safety. So we'll see more Waymo vehicles around the streets in Los Angeles and San Francisco counties. Apple is being slapped with a $2 billion fine by the European Union over... Music streaming apps. An investigation into Apple started in 2020 after Spotify filed a complaint saying it and other music streaming providers were forced to pay a 30% fee for purchases made using Apple's in-app payment system. Meanwhile, Apple Music did not have to pay that fee. So where are you going to buy it? I don't know. (laughs) Not where you have to pay an extra 30%. Mm -mm, No, thank you. Texas's controversial new immigration law is likely headed to the Supreme Court. Let me take the picture down. This is a big thing uh, that has been fought in Texas. But here's what we can tell you. This allows local officers to arrest anyone that they believe crossed the border illegally. It was blocked by a federal judge. That ruling has now been overturned. A federal appeals court is giving the federal government seven days to file a case with the U.S. Supreme Court. If they don't, that law will go into effect this weekend. So that's a big responsibility. Anyone you think is a, is a, here illegally, you can just stop them? No. It's craziness. It's the, this is the vigilanteism that will probably rule the day, especially if a new administration gets in. Mark, as you mentioned earlier, France becomes now the first country in the world to make abortion a constitutional right. The French parliament voting 780 to 72 in favor of this measure that amends the French constitution. Efforts to guarantee the right for abortion in France started in response to the United States Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade in 2022. Before the vote, French Prime Minister Gabriel Attal said, above all, we are sending a message to all women 
Your body belongs to you. French President Emmanuel Macron said a ceremony for the amendments passing will be held on Friday on International Women's Rights Day. Can't imagine a better day to do it. This report is sponsored by Tenuta Vineyards in Livermore, where it's a nice time, a nice day for a little sippy sip of Why Are You Yelling Red? (laughs) Bring it in. Why are you yelling? I'm going to take that red. I'm going to drink it up. Mm. Yeah, it's some good stuff. But the winery is beautiful. So if you're looking for a place to go on a weekend, maybe just go head out there on an afternoon, call them up. And see if you can go out and arrange a tasting at Tenuta Vineyards, 925-699-4576. Talk to Rich or Nancy. They say, give them 30 minutes, you'll be friends for life. And most people agree. Everyone I've spoken with agrees. They are the friendliest, kindest people. So head out to Tenuta Vineyards. Check out the wine. You can look at it online as well. And I'm telling you that Why Are You Yelling Red is delicious. So make sure that you get your exclusive Mark Thompson Show 10% off by when you talk to Richard Nancy saying smash it with your iron rod that's mm. exactly right wow. smash it with your iron rod and walk away with your 10% off you are a winner wow. I'm Kim McAllister this is the Mark Thompson show they had to close down an entire radio station to silence him and now he's here ladies and gentlemen Mark Thompson. The Mark Thompson Show. Who's Mark Thompson? It's unbelievably offensive. I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. George Santos here. A lot of people are telling me you're a liar. That's pure speculation. There's always been in this country 30 to 35 percent idiots. Morning. Where are my weed smokers at? Your Honor, I'd like to ask for a recess. Can you let him finish, sir? You cannot say you love your country. That was very inappropriate. Don't talk to me that way. What do you think I'm going to say to you? Whoever is producing this thing has no idea what they're doing. Saudi Arabia pays cash. Great to have everybody here this Monday, momentous with a uh, SCOTUS decision. We talked a little bit about it to start the show, so if you want to get more on that, you can go back. I think it'll be well written about and well opined on in the days to come. Opined would be a ding word. We also announced that Wednesday will be the first play-in for the Mark's Madness Tournament that will actually begin a week from Wednesday, all right? But the play-in pits two drops against each other on Wednesday, uh, on, in the first hour, and then two drops against each other in the second hour of the show. Those two drops that play in, that win, they will move on to the next round. Uh, Mark's Madness is fun. We, You don't have to have a bracket. You can just vote as the drops come up. But uh, we enjoy it every year. We took it from the radio, and we've done it here. Now, this will be the second uh, annual uh, here on YouTube, but we were doing it every year on the radio for a long time, and it, it, it's just fun for us. So where do you um, find the where do you find the bracket? So the bracket will be uh, Albert will fill us in. He'll have uh, complete uh, a information on it, uh, and B I think on Wednesday, and B he'll have. Uh, you don't need a bracket yet now because we don't have the seating all in. So you could even if you uh, knew where the bracket was, and I don't know where it is. It's mm-hmm. it's kept, the information is kept in the commissioner's. Uh, office until uh, the moment yeah. that he releases okay. it. But uh, he um, will have a video also that will show us how to fill out the bracket and everything. So there's going to be instructional stuff okay. here on our channel, and Albert will take you through both uh, how to get a bracket, how right. to fill out a bracket, and I think it'll be a lot of fun. Okay. So and there's that. Um, I've got comments, and then I want to tell you about our first meetup 
of the new year. I haven't mentioned it much, and uh, it's coming up next Thursday. Isn't that right, Kim? Yeah. That's correct. N- next mm-hmm. Thursday. So uh, we want to do that as well. So um, here's a, a giant sweeper for you, some additional drops that might make it into Mark's Madness, and then I want to talk about the Supreme Court docket. So we'll get to all of that as we continue. Smash the like button like a boss. Mark Thompson, show. The Mark Thompson Show. Who's Mark Thompson? Feels great, baby. Let me kick down the door and talk to my cheap sons and daughters. No context will suffice to explain the hurt and anguish caused by my words. I apologize to all who have been hurt. I stand corrected. I misspoke. My words upset so many people. And I wanted to apologize to the Asian community, the Asian American community. America. The end. There's never been anything like this. Do I hit it long? Is Trump strong? Huh? Who is having that conversation? It's fantastic. That's not fake. That's real. The science is ridiculous. How would you handle this? We could try ignoring it, sir. If you get it in order, you get extra points. Listen to me. I don't want to hear you. You cannot say you love your country. Where are my weed smokers at? This is a word from the Lord, and he's not happy. There is no defense for my conduct. It was wrong, it was stupid, and I'm trying to be a better person. Don't ever use that word. It's a guilty pleasure to do that. Seriously, what the f***? Thank you for being here. It is cool that you are here. This is um, our show that we do every day live from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. on the West Coast. Adjust the time for wherever you're watching or listening. We also drop it and break it out with separate videos and shorts and that kind of thing. So thanks for all the support of the show and sharing the show. The way we grow the show is if you share something, it might be a short, it might be a video. You share it to Facebook, let's say. Kim does a little bit of that. Do you do, do you, I, I, you're on Facebook and I'm not really on Facebook. Do we yeah. have a, a presence there? What is we our story? We have a Mark Thompson Show Facebook page and we also have, there's an old one called KGO in Exile. And that one's actually pretty popular. So oh, sometimes really? okay. I'll post Mark Thompson stuff on that page too. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Think it through says, Mark, your show has the absolute best sound cuts. Top shelf. Well, that is the best shelf, the top shelf. Thank top you very much. There's no other shelf you'd want to be on. No, Although, I mean, that is you the... You could argue the eye level shelf is better. Oh, uh, for, yes, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, the top shelf would be hard to reach. But, well, you, be, you don't need to reach it as much because it is uh, the most expensive shelf. And uh, so True. not as many people. But anyway, I'm going to yeah. thank you, uh, think it through. Uh, thank you so much. For that uh, nice uh, thought. Um, well, I did want to mention again, and I wonder, Tony, if you could put up the information that our meet and greet or meet up, however you want to call it, it's the first virtual meet and greet of 2024. Actually, there's a newer graphic, and of course we put up the older graphic because that's what we do. But th- we, we really call it a meetup. The only reason I call it a meetup because then the email matches what it's called. Mm. That's the reason for the graphic. And the graphics are done on a volunteer basis by one of our listeners and viewers. It's really cool that she steps up that way. She does great She's stuff. Amazing. Here it is. The first virtual meetup, and all the information is here on the screen, but I'll just give it to you. It's our first virtual meetup of 2024 with special guests. I'll give you an example. Spencer Christian is going to be there. Uh, Jim Avila, who is the former White House correspondent, longtime political expert and analyst who had to give up being the expert and analyst on the show because he is now back on 
on the air at ABC 10, I think it is. And um, he leads up. He's their lead investigative reporter in San Diego. But uh, he can meet with us and give you his opinions off the air. So that's going to be kind of fun. Things he can't say on the air, he'll be able to say off the air. Mm -hmm. And as you know, he believes Biden has a good chance of winning, despite all the polling. In any case, um, so he'll be there. Michael Shore will be there. Uh, Michael Snyder, the culture blaster. A lot of the regulars on the show will be part of our first virtual meetup of 2024. So it's March 14th, 630 to 830. We have two hours because we want to be able to hang out, talk. If you have questions, if you have thoughts, if you have anything, we want to really have time to hang out. It's a 20 person limit. So we're not going to have more than 20 people again, so that we can really interact. And you sign up at our PayPal. You, know, you pop a $50 donation in to lock up a spot. It's a fundraiser so that we ask for that donation. But when you make the donation, just note meet and greet and you're in. All right. And then if you want to say, Hey, I did it. Uh, or you have some question you want to make sure we bring up in the meet and greet, you can reach us at MTS meetup at gmail.com. Mark Thompson show meetup at gmail.com. Maybe we'll ask Karen Dawn may want to be part of things, too. I don't know. We haven't asked her yet. We still haven't completely baked the cake. But Albert will be in Taiwan and is joining from Taiwan, everyone. What? Yes. How dedicated is that? That's really cool. Tony. Yeah. God knows where Tony will be, but he will be part of <laughs> Thanks, things. Thanks, Tony. I'll be there. Yeah. So you've got Very all of the regulars, and you can ask whatever... Um, 20 person limit is too exclusive when you have 700 viewers. Well, you're 700 viewers right now. And we, yeah. there, of course, there are thousands of viewers who have a sort of magnificent show. A lot but, of people listen after hours, too. Oh, I think how that's many, what, what How many subscribers are we up to now, Tony? Because we were at like oh, well over 25,000. We have to be pushing what, 26, 27? I think we broke 27 over the weekend, right? Yeah, wow. 27,000. So that's very, it. very, uh, very. Yeah. That. We're Very headed cool. to 30, people. We're headed to 30. But it's really great that everybody uh, is subscribing and is joining and is interacting. You know, most of all, it's interacting. I mean, I really think that's the magical part of this platform is right. that we can read your comments. We can respond to them. Those can obviously interact with us in real time on the chat. But those who aren't with us in, you know during these hours that we're live, you can still interact with us and we still see it. So it's, a, oh, it's really cool. You've been known to go back and read those comments on the air that are left after hours. So oh yeah. my God, yes. Especially if yeah. it's a negative comment. You know I love those. <laughs> um, can you post the sign up on the chat? Uh, maybe. Uh, Brian is asking, Tony, can... Well, the sign up is just PayPal. You just click through to PayPal. It is in the... It, oh, can you put it in the chat? It's not in the chat. The uh, Tony, the can, chat? You add the, mm. can you add the... PayPal link to the chat? I'll do it right now. Okay, cool. Thanks, Tony. So that is something we will do. Good thought, Brian. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, I know that I talked about this. Uh, I have Karen waiting. I know that I talked about this docket. Let me just quickly touch on it, and then I want to get to Karen Dawn. Uh, the docket is the Supreme Court docket. I know that there's a lot of talk about the Supreme Court decision today, and now they are facing this immunity case, which is huge. Um, but I want to touch on something that I think is a worth touching on related to the Supreme Court and the number of cases in the pipeline. The Mark Thompson Show. So in the next four months, the Supreme Court is going to resolve a huge number of huge cases. The, the decisions are going to, A, influence the election, and B, have an enormous effect on life, law, and culture in America. That's just what Supreme Court decisions do. And they are backlogged with cases that they will be hard-pressed to get through. They have massive, I mean, free speech online, the power of the feds, and the power of federal government agencies. You know, we've talked a lot about that here. Like, for example, completely undercutting the EPA's ability to regulate toxins in water, air, and soil. I mean, this is going to appear before the Supreme Court. And as you know, I think they have an agenda to do just that, to undercut the EPA's power. But they are crunched for time. They're far behind. So they've announced just five decisions 
92% of argued cases still have to be formally resolved before the term ends in late June or early July. Many legal experts are looking in, they're going, it's impossible. They are dealing with landmark decisions, unprecedented situations, a major presidential candidate facing criminal prosecution who has this entire problem with immunity that has to be ruled upon. I mean, that's probably a the highest profile, okay, even though it, it maybe shouldn't be. I mean, as I say, I think the undercutting of the feds and their ability to regulate both for the consumer and for the environment is huge. Will you but, be surprised if the Supreme Court comes down on Trump's side regarding presidential immunity? Yeah, I think that they'll mm. rule against presidential immunity. I, I do. But again, that's based on what I've read. It's based mm. on listening to legal experts. It's based on David Katz. It's based right. on David K. Johnston. Mm -hmm. But we can review, though, that prediction with David K. Johnston tomorrow. Yeah. But Steve Vladek, who's the University of Texas law professor, he tracks a lot of stuff with the justices at the Supreme Court. He said in his uh, weekly newsletter that the Supreme Court, this is a quote, is being pulled in more directions than it's capable of being pulled in. It is in the middle of just about every significant contemporary public policy, political, and cultural debate. This is not a play, he says, for sympathy on the justice's part, but a genuine concern that the court is not well situated to handle this onslaught of high stakes, politically charged cases. Some of this buildup is self-inflicted. A lot of people say major issues from past terms like abortion, gun rights are coming again due for this term. And this code of conduct thing over the Clarence Thomas deal and the taking of money and lavish trips and gifts that justices have gotten from billionaire friends who have business before the court, the demands for recusal, but there is no recusal at the Supreme Court level. These are things that also divert the court's attention, it's suggested. So when you have immigration questions and all of these other questions that we've touched upon. It's being talked about as an almost impossible Supreme Court docket to wade through it all. So watch this because you're going to, I mean, and in days to come with David Katz, David K. Johnson and beyond, I'll review some of the other cases that we don't hear about because they're getting bumped out of the headlines by yeah. some of the others that I mentioned. But we'll have to see. I mean, again, I'll remind you, since the workload is so overwhelming, then they should definitely add more justices to do the work, right? <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> Shadow producer Calvin Wong is nice. right. I'd love yeah. to see the court expanded. And uh, I mean, last thing, and then I'll get to Karen. The Democrats, they just don't take the advantage when it's offered to them. They, they, don't, they don't act aggressively enough. And they're dealing with an incredibly aggressive GOP that is ready to undermine everything. SCOTUS is so scary right now, says Vicky is right. But I'll remind you, Thomas is openly corrupt, says uh, BBB, exactly right. Of course, it's, it's insane. Look, when you won't recuse yourself from a case that involves your own wife, his own wife was involved in J6, actively, and he won't recuse himself. He's a, look, as you know, I think the problems with the court, uh, corrupt, informed by insane religiosity that's even, you know, worked its way into decisions, it's a, it's a scary time. It's a scary time. And since Congress can't get any do anything done, you really have legislation from the bench, right? Anyway, that's a little bit of uh, the practical realities of uh, both the political environment and also the legal realities that analysts are saying, hey, this is, this is trouble. There's a lot here, and it's going to be tough to get through it all. And they're moving at a pretty good clip, and it still will be tough to get through it all. Anyway, that's uh, the latest on the Supreme Court, and we've already weighed in with, um, played you some Norm Eisen at the beginning of the show about the Supreme Court decision, which was noted also in our um, chat as being noteworthy for not 
ruling on Trump's insurrection participation, but more just on the constitutionality. Here's Lori. She says, I do think it's important that SCOTUS made no mention of Trump not being an insurrectionist. This judicial opinion from the lower court remains in the record that he is an insurrectionist. Charge him, please, she said. And then Randy makes sort of the same point, I think. The ruling today was not that Trump was or wasn't an insurrectionist. The ruling was that Colorado couldn't keep Trump off the ballot. Seems like the correct interpretation of the 14th Amendment. I have other comments, but I'll save them for later. We have The Mark Thompson Show. On Mondays, we like to pause for a moment and say a word about animals. Now, a word about animals on The Mark Thompson Show. And our uh, lovely visitor to A Word About Animals, Karen Dawn from Dawn Watch, everyone. Dawn Watch, the daily animal world news watch. You could find Dawn Watch on Facebook and beyond. She has a very active following, a newsletter that I really enjoy, kind of looking at animal issues as they're, as they're covered in the media. How are you, Karen? Welcome. I'm great. You know, I feel like I get invited to a very intelligent party every Monday. Oh, that's so sweet. Well, um, I, uh, that's how it I, feels what? Here. <laughs> uh, well, please add to the party. What's, what do you okay. have for us today? Well, you know, I think a little bit of animal cruelty always adds to every party. Don't you? Oh my God. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, no, you know, last week, um, we were talking about, a, a fl- we were talking about Flacco Flaco. And that I was calling Flaco. Now, again, is it Flaco or Flacco? It's Flaco. I think it's Flaco. Okay. How does Fla- How did Flaco say it before uh, Flaco's untimely uh, passing? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Good. Okay. Well, then. <laughs> anyway, what we, you were talking about, and, and, and we actually released your video as a short, and there was um, a lot of reaction to that, and it seemed like a heartbreaking story no matter where you stood on on things. So tell which me, what was the why, follow-up? Which is why we're revisiting this this week, and of course, we're going to find the lemonade in, in the lemons and uh, some of the things that have followed his his story. But yeah, people were very, very moved by Flaco's demise. They were um, you know, in love with his story soaring around New York and then uh, quite distressed when he got killed, but we kind of knew that he would and remind uh, everybody uh, uh just uh, briefly oh, for those who in yeah. case yeah there might be people watching who not only didn't see us next week but might have somehow missed flaco flaco is an owl who was um let out of his enclosure by a bunch of vandals a year ago at uh, the central park zoo which is owned by the um same people who own the bronx zoo it's the world conservation society which everybody thinks is you know one of the world's best zoos and that's something that mark and i touched on last week which is that no matter how good a zoo is it's still captivity and even at this supposedly wonderful zoo the new york times wrote that flaco had been living in an enclosure about the size of department store window. And he was in there for 13 years before some animal rights activists, liberation activists cut the enclosure, let him out. And of course, what you and I discussed here is that, you know, if he wanted to go back in because he wanted his three square meals a day, et cetera, he could have, he knew he he was often around Central Park. He spent most of his time in Central Park. He knew where that uh, horrible enclosure was and could have gone back and been let in. he chose to be free um unfortunately you know it's really really hard for animals to make it in a human environment and i expressed the delight that at least he got to live for a year before he died and a lot of other people seem to have felt that way but that's what we talked about last week this week what i wanted to address was uh, is that Um, Just today in the New York Times, and it's not even printed yet, it'll probably be printed in tomorrow's New York Times, is a column by Margaret Renkel, who is simply one of my favorite humans. And we've um, looked at her writing before on this segment when she wrote about a a bunch of turtles who had chosen to um, lay their eggs near a a volleyball court and and some students um, made the effort to move the eggs every single year um, to an even safer place. And uh, she has such a, a beautiful way of looking at the world and a beautiful way of writing about it. And she talks about 
um, the fact that, um, you know, Flaco couldn't have made it just the same way a quarter of a million birds don't make it in New York every single work every single year apparently two billion birds are killed um thanks to human activity uh in america every single year and her column talks about how we've just got to do better um not just for this flaker sake of flaker who we loved but for um all of these animals not all of whom we feel quite so strongly about and um, I want to mention something she mentions is that there's a couple of bills in the uh, New York legislature which were just sort of hanging out, not doing much until um, Flaco's death um, buoyed people's emotions around this. And um, this is, uh, I'm, I'm sure you see that Tony is now showing us um, the uh, Margaret Renkel column. And I sent you guys a guest link so that you can include that in the notes on this because uh, Don Notch has a subscription and I can provide guest links, um, gift links, because uh, she's really worth reading. But she mentions in her piece that there's a couple of pieces of legislation. One is the um, Bird Safe Buildings Act, which has actually been renamed the Flaco Act. And the other is the Dark Skies Protection Act. And the irony is that Neither of these um, pieces of the legislation probably would have saved Flaco, but um, they might save a quarter of a million other birds. The reason they probably wouldn't have saved Flaco is I didn't know this until I'd read Margaret's column this morning, that um, these, these um, acts are both designed to stop birds from crashing into buildings, but it seems highly unlikely that Flaco actually crashed into a building. Um, somebody, his um, necropsy isn't out yet, but somebody looking at his injuries said, well, if he'd crashed into a building, he would have had a whole bunch of head head injuries. That's not what he had. He had body slam injuries. It seems far more likely that he fell off his perch and crashed into the ground. You know, his whole body crashed into the ground. And huge, big guess, but, you know, very likely is rat poison. We mentioned that last week, that when people use these rodenticides that kill rats, before the rats die, they get a bit slow, and they're therefore the ones that are most likely to uh, be caught by birds. And uh, other wildlife in California here, it's um, mountain lions. Uh, we had P22 full of rodenticide not long before he died. And in New York, it might might well be that rodenticide killed Flaco. But, um, her whole, what she talks about is that, you know what, I'd love it if Tony might put up this quote, Mark, and I said I'd ask if you'd read it because we all love listening to your voice, um, if he's got it there. But this is her basic point, and I want to talk about some of her points based on this. If you don't mind reading it, Mark. Yeah, I'll read it. I, I also have a follow-up. Um, the a quote from Margaret Rankle is, to protect the animals we love, we'll need to think differently about the animals we do not love, to live peaceably among them, We'll need to work harder to do what wilderness, what wildness, I should say, uh, requires of us. Wild animals are not our enemies. They are our neighbors. Every owl is flaco. Flaco. Look, uh, <laughs> looked at through the, he'll always be flaco to me. Uh, every owl is, uh, is flaco. Look at, uh, looked at through the lens of biodiversity loss, every toad and rabbit and squirrel and fox and coyote and goldfinch and cricket and lacewing and roly-poly, they could all be flaco. We just need to learn to love them the way we loved him. And it's such an interesting point that, you know, we give this owl a name, we give this owl a story, he escaped from this enclosure that was so small, and that's a compelling story, right? He becomes a figure, a personality, but the reality is all animals, the who live in the wildness of it all they're all figures and personalities that we could give names to and backstories to i guess that's her point absolutely and whereas people might have enjoyed ratatouille our general the way general the way we treat rats is probably the reason that flaco you know you say to flaco and i'll say to flaco or something there you go tomato and tomato <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, the way we treat rats is probably why why this sweet owl who we have to work out what to call um, has died. And um, the lack of concern we show for the quarter of a million birds who are killed every single year in New York City is um, also 
why um, he, he, he might be why he is dead. And so whether or not he was actually killed thanks to the way the buildings are built, the fact that um, in his honor, they are re, uh, resubmitting these bills and putting them forward again is such a beautiful thing. And one of them is to the Safe, uh, the Bird Safe Buildings Act is to um, enforce laws that um, say that buildings have to be built with birds in mind. So for example, the kind of glass you use can make a, a huge difference to whether a bird flying along, um, depending on the way it reflects, the bird might think there's trees ahead when in fact it's just a reflection of the trees. And if you use less reflective glass, that's much less likely to happen. And um, with lights that are just left on all night long and um, completely send the birds in the wrong direction, um, getting these skyscrapers to turn off their lights can make a huge difference. And it's interesting because it's almost karmic because there's so many different reasons why we shouldn't be burning nights, uh, lights all night long. And one of them is to save the birds and uh, Flaco. It's typical of human nature to be so much more concerned about the loss of one individual than about the, the quarter of a billion who are killed every year as they they fly into buildings well again um, and it's because we've given that one individual the sort of three-dimensional quality but the reality is all of those sweet souls they deserve that same consideration they won't and there get are it, sweet souls they, with families and spouses so you know what we call spouses but you know they first realize that swans mate for life and now they're realizing that yeah it seems that most birds do i mean they're just not all that different from us we had a question for you i wonder if you could take mm -hmm. it from randy who's very active in our chat usually has some pretty uh interesting <laughs> things to say, to say. Uh -huh. uh, randy says just to ask what's the basis for karen's analysis of how the owl died every article i see on google indicates the owl died flying into a building Right. Uh, yeah, I tried to ex explain that, Randy. Just in, if you read Margaret Renkel's article this morning, she quotes somebody who I've forgotten who it is, but it's in there in the article. And he's taken, he's a, more of a bird expert. He's taken a, um, a good look at Flego's injuries. And if he had uh, flown into a building, he would be far more likely to have head injuries. Um, but what he's got is body slam injuries, the kind of injuries you have falling from a great height. So it seems far more likely that he fell. He was on a perch somewhere and he fell, which means he was not perfectly healthy and then flew into a building. Either way, um, you know, it's human caused, whether it, whether it's um, that our buildings, we may have made so little attempt to make them bird proof or because we're using these rodenticides with no concern for the horribly painful way they kill rats and also kill all the other animals who eat the rats. Yeah, regardless, so, you're saying it's a um, it's something it's that, human uh, killed. That has but to yeah, this Margaret Renkel article links to an, another article where an expert has looked at, and again, the necropsy hasn't come back yet, so we don't know this for sure. We don't know whether he's going to turn up with rodenticide inside of him, but it seems it's looking more and more likely. I don't want to throw you a curve, but again, it's something that's being talked about in the chat. So I, I will uh, give it to you. And it is the, I'm sorry, now it's got no, let me just see, maybe I have it here. Um, uh, Mark, ta here it is. Um, talk to Karen, it should be, about the thousands or millions of cattle being burned and killed in the Texas fires. It is a sad fact that it is unspeakably awful for these the livestock being well i don't to say killed yeah by the fires in texas karen's gonna have a an unusual take on this which is that i'm sorry they're being burned alive but anybody who does any um research into what animals go through in slaughterhouses which is exactly where they were heading um know that that wasn't going to be a great death either and and they were going to be trucked to these slaughterhouses with no food or water um in you know if they weren't going to be killed for a couple of months then it was going to be in the 110 degree texas heat in in uh trucks with no food and water so i'm like yeah burnt alive really really sucks but what was uh being planned for them wasn't great either well that is <laughs> i will say respectfully one of the most uh uh, it's interesting, uh, and of course, it is um, uh, unusual, and it's because you wouldn't expect that, which is very much on brand for you.
But I would say it's tortured, uh, respectfully. I think uh, that's you know, a little I like me saying uh, to a, you know a human being, "Well, your last five years are going to be so tough with the." Uh, with all the cancer treatments and all the rest, you're better off just being, uh, but it's not just euthanized. You're burned alive, uh, Karen. I'm sorry. That is a, that is a fate that's, that's horrifying. And those creatures endured it and continue to endure it. I think Mark, you might not be aware that in Texas on these cattle farms, and we are talking about degrees of heat over hundred, there's no rules that say that the cattle have to have any shade whatsoever. And so a lot, there's a certain percentage of cattle who die every single year simply from the elements, from the heat. I'm not sure that being burnt alive in a few minutes is worse than dying of being parched, baked in the sun with no shelter at all um, over a few days or whatever. So I Well, I, I mean, I, you, point, and again, I, you wrote, you know, is in your book, this is where I learned this fact, your book, which I guess is being updated, they're going to come out with it, thanking the monkey. I learned this, which I have regurgitated uh, ad nauseum to various people, which is as animals go that are part of the food process, and it's all awful, I mean really awful, the less awful is being a, uh, a cow in the cattle uh, world in the beef world a beef cow not a dairy a dairy cow is the other end of the extreme it's horrifying it's awful we'll talk about it another time but so i kind of am informed by that which i read in your book but you're saying well yeah but texas cattle you're saying are really in bad shape so uh, that's a detail perhaps i wasn't aware of okay first i have to you know i was sort of smiling slightly while you were talking about this awful stuff and i just have to sort of apologize and say you know it's just to me it's a little bit funny that i say hey it's so nice to show up to this party and i'm talking about all these new rules um to do with flaco and how we're going to protect him and then here we're talking about cattle being burnt alive and it's like oh my well word, it was okay. in the chat it was in response <laughs> I, to it somewhere i understand i'm not i just wanted to let people know that if they saw me sort of smiling that was going through my head which is that why is it all so awful and the answer is because what we do to animals is generally awful and there are exceptions but it's awful um it's also in my book mark i'll get you a page later but about the fact that um that cattle are not protected from the elements um on some of these ranches and they just uh they they put it in the um when they're doing their calculations of how much it costs per head of cattle they take into account that some of them are going to die from the elements so believe me these as yeah so as uh, you know as summer's coming along i'm so sorry to hear these um poor cows are being burnt up but god knows what was ahead for them anyway it's the uh you know what we what we do with livestock with animals who we have bred to be food in this country is unconscionable and i'm not here saying you must go vegan because that's not useful and because you know what if somebody's going out and hunting a deer who's roaming around with their family and getting shade and whatever <laughs> i mean this i, I um, don't i, I can't mean believe this. okay all right yeah. I'm so sorry. they're running around it's, with their family getting totally some shade different. enjoying their offspring if somebody's wants to hunt them and kill them it's fine <laughs> It's not fine with me, and I'm certainly not going to do it, but it's an ethical issue you can talk about, but and I'm not going to rant yeah, about yeah, yeah. it. There are, there are plenty the of hunters who watch we, the show. Yeah. But the way we treat, and, you know, and and, uh, and I, I, res I, I could respectfully argue with them, but it would be respectful in a way that I'm not going to argue with anybody who supports factory farming or who supports keeping cattle out on ranches with no shade. It's just yeah. absolutely crazy and cruel the way we treat uh, animals raised for food. And to me, it is interesting that people are so worried that these these cows who had the worst day imaginable uh, ahead of them, um, people are so upset that they got burnt up in a fire. Do you know, there are absolutely animals raised for food who get boiled alive. We've mentioned this, I think, on the show <laughs> oh before, that they say a million turkeys get boiled alive no, of course, um, in our slaughterhouses. Mm. So, you know, that's why my reaction is, well, that's nice that people care so much about these cattle being burnt alive. But I, you know, would urge them, if they do care, to do a little bit more research on what happens to the animals that um, we are we are raising on our food industry because it's it's so not okay.
there are great uh, strides being made uh, in the treatment of animals and protection of uh, pets that are also affected by uh, certain things that are in place to take care of pests, et cetera. We'll get to that in uh, weeks to come. I want to do something about it today, but I'm out of time. Um, Karen, thank you. Again, it's dawnwatch.com. You can also find Dawn Watch on Facebook. And uh, you're so lovely to spend time with us on Monday. So thank you so much, Karen. It's always a joy to see you guys. Karen Dawn, everybody. That's a word about animals. for today. Join the flock again next time for a word about animals on the Mark Thompson Show. Tony, I am seeing uh, people asking for the link in the chat for our first virtual meetup, which is March 14th of that evening. Do we yeah, have I it? Threw it? It's in today's description as well. So if you just go to the description for today, it's oh, right, great. right there. Yeah, too. so right under all the, the details, which you need the time, yeah. RSVP, the how time, much, you, you, you put the, the RSVP note, in front of them. But donation. again, you just go to our PayPal, you toss in 50 for the to, to lock up your spot. And um, and we'll lock it up. Just put a note when you put the 50 in there, uh, MTS meetup or meetup or meet and greet, however you, want, however you want to call it. It's our first virtual meetup of the new year. We'll have special guests. I mentioned Spencer Christian, Jim Avila, Michael Shore, just a, a few of the who will be through. 6.30 to 8.30 Pacific time. We should probably add that. But uh, it's a 20-person limit. But there's still spots right now. We've only mentioned it a few times. So mm-hmm. sign up at our PayPal link with a $50 donation to lock up a spot. And and note, meet, and greet with your donation. Or meet up, whatever you want to call it. And you can also RSVP. This is a Gmail only for the meetup. MTS meetup at gmail.com. So, the Mark Thompson Show. That's that. Now, wow, there's a lot there in that Karen Dawn segment. Yeah. Wow. It's always uh, interesting. I find it impossible for us to agree sometimes. You know what I mean? Yeah. If I'm not militant enough, she disagrees. (laughs) If I'm too militant, she disagrees. Very tough. But it's always provocative. So It always makes uh, you think. That's definitely true. This, uh, can I just get some quick comments on the true crime story? Bill Doherty says, I know I'm late commenting on the Berman murder story. I've been to the Saline Valley many times in a Land Cruiser. People do go there in RVs and end up getting stuck. It's very easy to get lost. And he had a a follow-up to that as well. Yeah. On the Boeing story, Boeing has been failing for decades, says Mars, formerly Al Anonymous. This is reminiscent of failed practices and manufacturing for greed. Exactly. Well, they've shown and been shown in many investigations that the government has, the U.S. government has reluctantly, I say reluctantly because essentially Boeing owns the FAA. They've reluctantly brought forward, which suggests literal negligence on the part of Boeing. That's what's happening here. Um, And uh, on the true crime, if Mark ever goes missing, we need Doug to investigate Courtney. He knows his stuff. He does. That Doug is great. If you missed it, you really have to. Um... And as to the red light. Yeah, why the red light? Why do we have the red light? Mark there? is panicking. We should only be on yellow alert. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Tony, explain to me why the hell I've got a red light there. I, I don't know. I don't understand. These guys come in here. They've got all the lighting. And I so, just try to behave. The idea usually is, is a lot of people do. A lot of these, a lot of YouTubers and stuff they do is that you just do a little bit of color in the background. I That's the one light we had. We had a what? We had one with a red bulb, so we went with it. Well, I, he <laughs> he mentioned Jefferson he wanted had? to put blue back there, and I said we don't really. I mean, the colors of the show. Also, are, if you look at the logo, it's got red in the logo. Yeah, red. In the, in but the, it the, does the, the, the it does bubble. look a little red alerty. I mean, did we need a light back there? Ah. Yeah. Um, we were going to put a light back there, no matter what. Uh, uh, some kind of light going on on the on the blind on those back yeah, there. Yeah, that's just that was always part it. of the yeah, Kim, You don't get it. You don't get it. You need a light back there, Kim. You do need a light, apparently. I didn't know this. But you see, there's a whole, all this, you you, you just leave that wall like that. Is that what you're saying, Tony? You leave it white like this? The, That's the, the plan right now. Okay. We'll see. Okay. Huh. It's I a, mean, we've it, gone through many iterations, you know. We don't yeah. want the banner back. I think we know that much at least, right? <laughs> yeah, the like banner Ab- didn't work out. We don't know where the banner went. It, <laughs> looks like, it looks like Abraham Lincoln's on fire is what it looks like. Well, uh, well. Lincoln is angry about where this country is going. <laughs> I can imagine so. And right, Lincoln, Washington, 
that's um, angry Beethoven. So basically, that's you're setting America on fire. Another angry Beethoven. Where's oh. Frederick Douglass, the greatest American? Hmm. Oh, here's Frederick. I need Frederick Douglass to to be in the actual shot. Yeah. Frederick Douglass should should be president for life. I would have loved to have seen that, but um, I'll put I'll put Fred up in back. But uh, anyway, that's the thinking, Kim. Any other questions before I? Uh... The Mark Thompson Show. A white light strip would be great, says BB. You can do that. All right. Thank you. Anybody with any suggestions? Thanks, Tony. You can send them to us. Jefferson Graham and will be here tomorrow, and you can just you can address Jefferson directly. I'm sure he'd love to hear it. Kim had a blue a, light. It looked like the police department colors. was here. Oh, no. yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe the blue light is the. It's I don't a whole know. color wheel thing. It's those primary colors, and just yeah, the red, the blue, orange, like that. Red reminds me of a red state, says Grady. Wow. Oh. Um, I like the red alert thing. It is kind of a red alert thing, I think, more than anything. But I, I hear you. I don't I don't know. It's not what I worry about. This stuff, I'm worried about a lot of other stuff on this YouTube platform and then, of course, i got to worry about this, too. So, uh, apologies. I'm so, Shadow Stevens for the Mark Johnson Shadow. Show. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Shadow. Not a second too soon. After Party Live going Bye down time. now. Bye-bye. Tomorrow, David K. Johnston. Till then, bye-bye. Thank you.